As bad as the pandemic is now, the numbers are clearly showing it's just getting worse. 65,000 new coronavirus cases confirmed yesterday. California and Texas both set new daily records. And 54 hospitals in Florida, 54 are at full capacity in their ICUs. Oklahoma's Governor Kevin Stitt also announced today that he's tested positive for COVID-19, first U.S. governor to contract the virus. Stitt, as you may remember, hosted Donald Trump's social distance and mask-free rally in Tulsa just a couple of weeks back, which state officials assured us is unrelated. But now he's considering a statewide mask mandate now. Better late than never, I guess, especially with warnings like this coming from the head of the CDC. This is a serious issue. I am worried. I do think the fall and the winter of 2020 and 2021 are going to be the, probably one of the most difficult times that we've experienced in American public health. I might say it was at least a little comforting that the head of the CDC is taking this pandemic so seriously, except that a few hours after Dr. Redfield made that statement, we learned the Trump administration was taking away the CDC's control over nationwide coronavirus data effective today. Instead, they're telling hospitals to send all of it to Health and Human Services to be kept in a database that's not available to the public, nor the researchers who've been trying to get a grasp on how this virus is spreading to try to keep people safe. But the administration's war on facts and science does not end there. There's also the op-ed White House trade advisor Peter Navarro wrote about the nation's top infectious disease doctor last night claiming, quote, Anthony Fauci has been wrong about everything I have interacted with him on. The White House claims Navarro acted on his own with that piece, and Trump says he shouldn't have done it. Trump probably wrote it. And speaking of baseless claims, here's the president last night on CBS. Why are African Americans still dying at the hands of law enforcement in this country? And so are white people. So are white people. What a terrible question to ask. So are white people. More white people, by the way. More white people. Wow. For the record, a 2018 study found black men are around three and a half times more likely to be killed by law enforcement than white men are. And black adults are about five times more likely than whites to say they've been unfairly stopped by police. Just this week, senior editor of the Bay State Banner, it's a weekly black-owned newspaper in Boston, said he was stopped after taking pictures on the job outside Roxbury Municipal Court. Yahoo Miller tweeted the story shortly after, saying, I was approached by about seven BPD officers. They FIO'd me. First time in more than 20 years, I thought the gray hair disqualified me. Apparently not. FIO, of course, stands for field interrogations and observations, which can mean anything from a quick conversation to a stop and frisk or a search. And around 70 percent of those in Boston involve black men and women. The next day, Miller tweeted this. I am not asking for an apology. I didn't walk away from the encounter feeling disrespected or diminished in any way. I know police are having their cars vandalized and they're on edge. I found it mildly amusing. They FIO'd me, but I didn't object to answering their questions. Yahoo Miller joins me now. Yahoo, it's good to see you. Thanks so much for doing this. Thanks for having me. So you're stopped by police, seven officers, while you're taking a picture. You don't want an apology. In fact, you said you were mildly amused by it. Why? It, you know, it, it doesn't affect me as a you know somebody who's in the news media. Um, any interaction I have with the police, um, if they're observing me, I'm also observing them. I have the power to write about what they do, and you know we do that on a regular basis. We've been following um, you know issues like the FIOs and the gang database for quite a few years now. So um, you know it's not going to do anything. It's not going to have an impact on me. Younger people like the majority of the kids were getting stopped to most of whom are African-American, it does have uh, more serious consequences. But do you, well, that's perfect segue. You said you didn't feel diminished or disrespected. Do you worry that in some way unintentionally you are minimizing that kind of behavior for someone who might feel diminished or disrespected? Um, no, I mean, I think my, my experience is different. I mean, it would be very similar if you were stopped by the police um, and questioned, you know, and they said, we're going to put you in a gang database. 
um, you'd kind of laugh it off because nothing's really going to happen to you. Same with me. I mean, it's, nothing's going to, there are no consequences for me. Um, you know, I do, you know, because I write about what happens to young people, I do know that, that um, they face more serious consequences and that, that um, many young people are stopped like two, three times a week. And, uh, you know, the, being in an FIO database um, means they're subject to higher levels of scrutiny and being in a gang database can have even more serious consequences. One last thing about this, then I want to move to that uh, database. Uh, I know you don't see this as a case of photographing while black, but to hearken back to what you said a minute ago, Yahoo, do you think if I was taking pictures outside Roxbury District Court, seven cops would have come over and questioned me? I don't think so. <laughs> I don't know. Chris Lovett, who uh, is also a reporter in Boston, he he, you know, sure. he was stopped for shooting photographs by the police. I think what happens next is sort of, you know, with me, they put me in the FIO database. I don't know if they do that with you. Um, and they, you know, uh, and and uh, you know, I I also don't think that um, they did that with him either. So let's talk about these FIOs. You know this very well, but I'm not sure everybody at home does. The most recent data from the Boston Police Department about these FIOs, uh, blacks in Boston, 25% of the population, 69% of the stops, whites, 45% of the population, 25% of the stops. You also tweeted that you were stopped a lot when you were younger, the 70s, 80s, and 90s. Is it fair to say not much has changed? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's it's difficult for me to say because because um, you know, it was a different time. I I do think that young people are subject to a greater level of scrutiny than I was. Um, I don't think I don't I don't know that they had an FIO database. I don't really think they did until the '90s, um, and they didn't have a gang database back then as well. Um, but what, what, you know. What, what I hear from, from kids is that, you know, again, they're being stopped multiple times a week. They're being illegally searched, um, patted down. Um, when I say illegally searched, you know, they're, they're not being arrested. There's no probable cause, but cops are going through their pockets or going through their school bags. Um, so I know that, it, that, um, that children now and young adults are having a much different experience than even what I had as a, as a teenager and a young adult. Yeah, but let's get back to you as a gray-haired guy, as, which is how you describe yourself, and a bit of a gray beard there, too, I should mm -hmm. say. You know, you said a couple of minutes ago, it's not going to happen to you. You're older. You're a journalist. I'm sure you were watching the same pictures I was watching a month or so ago when a person of color, a reporter, just to name one, for CNN, was arrested doing his job on the streets of Minneapolis after George Floyd was murdered. So it, why do you have such optimism that you're safer than some of your colleagues might be maybe i'm foolhardy but i, I also think that boston is is uh is a different city than than minneapolis and well, uh, sure is, you know, yeah. yeah i mean policing is different here um uh you know it, it's a smaller city and uh, i mean it's not a smaller city but i mean i mean you know i feel like uh uh I don't know, I just, I've never really, I mean, since I've been in my 30s and 40s, um, I've not felt uh, um, under a threat. I think, you know, the first time I got stopped when I was 10 years old was in Brookline. And when I was in my late 20s, I went through as a, as a journalist, you know, at two in the morning, I said, let's see how long it'll take us to drive through Brookline and get stopped. It took about 20 minutes. And then I wrote up an article about it. That kind of changed things for me, I think, that, that um, you know, I realized, like, I could write about, you know, these experiences and, uh, and you know, perhaps create some change. I'm not sure if that's actually happened in Brookline. I kind of doubt it. But, uh, but at least, you know, um, I understand that cops are observing me, but I'm also observing them. And I know that I can, I can have an impact on things. So if you were not offended, not a word you use, but I'm using by this stop by seven police officers, not one or two, but seven police officers. Were you at least offended that when you identified yourself as a reporter for a renowned institution like the Bay State Banner, that they said they didn't know what it was? I think the Boston Police Department has a problem. I mean, you know, maybe the, the Bay State Banner doesn't circulate enough in the suburbs or in Maine or wherever these officers are from. But I think, you know, I, I, think, I do think it's a problem in the department. There aren't enough officers who are from the neighborhoods that they're um, policing in. 
And uh, it, it clearly, they don't do enough to, to familiarize themselves with the neighborhoods where they're working. Um, so I think the police department could certainly do a better job with that. Well, uh, I know what it is, and you're doing great work there, and you have for decades. Yahoo, you. you're a better person than I am, and thank you very much for joining me tonight. I appreciate it. Thanks, Jim.